sometimes google is yeah now it's started yeah. okay great uh just a second i'll start my stopwatch just so that i don't exceed the time by a lot yeah uh am i audible guys yeah yeah cool uh so uh, good evening i am going to present uh, yugro capital uh, to all of you so this is a company where i have about 2% of my portfolio and i think this company is quite undervalued and uh, with you know performance uh, improving it should hopefully get re-rated so that's uh, why i am interested in this company okay so let's dive right in so we start with the story of ugro capital right it has a very interesting story so first we start with the vision and mission of the company okay what does the company talk about so uh, ugro basically is a is a company which got listed in uh, in 2019 okay so the company basically uh, you just if you read here the company envisions to spearhead india's transition of msme lending to the new age of on tap financing okay so we'll understand what they mean by uh, all of these uh, terms so basically they want to be the new leaders of msme financing in india okay and their mission and and their vision is basically to solve the unsolved problem of credit availability for the sme segment in india okay so they say that there is a 300 billion gap in in credit availability for the sme segment small business owners and they want to solve that problem they want to capture 1% market share there uh, which would make their uh, you know aum about 20000 crores yeah so that's their goal as on date they are at 25% of that so they are at uh, 5000 crores yeah and what they have done is uh, they basically have tried to divide the msme universe into interesting sectors so they have analyzed about 180 sectors and then they shortlisted the 180 to 20 sectors from 20 they finally decided they will play in nine sectors so they lent to nine sectors in the msme universe and they claim to be a very focused nbfc as a result of that so their credit models and everything are tailored towards these you know nine sectors so they say that because we are focused we gain more experience uh, in in uh, unique characteristics in understanding unique characteristics of these sectors and our underwriting of loans uh, becomes uh, progressively better okay yeah so now coming to the management and board quality so uh, the one important person driving this company is this guy this guy's photo that you see the very studious looking guy his name is sachindra nath okay he was the ceo of religare for i think 6 7 years in 2016 he decided to quit and he decided to find uh, found yugro capital uh, so a little bit of background about the guy so you can look at the red highlighted area so he was born in a small town and he worked in the carpet industry at the start of his career yeah so that gave him some unique insights about what the gaps are in msme financing where msmes suffer what are their problems are etc etc yeah then he proceeded to follow a career in finance but this thought of msme problems etc always stayed with him uh he quit religare so for those of you who don't know uh, uh, religare was actually owned by two punjabi brothers who also happened to be the owners of ranbaxi this pharmaceutical company called ranbaxi and ranbaxi had a lot of corporate governance issues so the company i think uh, shut down because of that and the two guys are in, i think in jail so they were also the founders of religare yeah and and it was during the time uh, when shachindranath was the ceo there so a lot of people you know they question uh, this guy about you know his his involvement in some of those activities etc uh, but they have actually you can see in the uh, red box at the bottom they have clearly specified that shachindra exited on misalignment on governance and dedicated himself to build an institutional platform started his entrepreneurial journey in 2016 so they have actually very very clearly called out that uh, you know whatever happened in religare this person was completely not in alignment uh, with, with that so we can gain some confidence uh, out of that as as shareholders yeah otherwise the first question a lot of people ask is okay he was in religare so how can we trust him uh, and we'll find out more reasons of why we can trust him because of the way he has set up this new company you know because of the corporate governance structure he has put in place we'll see how we can uh, begin to trust him 
Yeah. So the the last bit is the philosophy that he founded this company with. So I'll read out that sentence. As an entrepreneur in financial services, realize that focus on governance and the desire to create social impact are the best way to create institutions. This is what created Ugro, an institutional platform dedicated to small businesses. So notice the constant focus on institutional, right? So he is trying to establish a company which is more than just himself. And you will see that he's walking the talk in the way that he has structured the company. So he actually wants to create a company with pristine corporate governance, an institution which will last long after he ceases to be the executive chairman and managing director. OK, let's see how he is walking the talk. Let's first look at the uh, very quickly the history of Ugro. Yeah. So what Ugro did is uh, there was a listed company called Chokhani Securities. Yeah. So uh, yeah, actually, this is the first one. Sorry, I mean, the highlight came on the second uh, item. So the first item is in December 2017, actually. So uh, Shachindra went ahead and bought this company called Chokhani Securities. It was a listed company, but it was hardly operating. Yeah. So they bought this company. Then before a single amount of revenue was earned by, and, and he renamed the company Ugro, before a single rupee of revenue was earned, he managed to raise 435 million, 43, 50 crores of money from uh, PE P firms, yeah, uh, just on the basis of his vis vision and on the basis of his past experience. So this is very rare, yeah. Usually the journey of a listed NBFC is that one entrepreneur has a vision, he starts a business, he raises capital from friends and family, starts a business, the business gradually grows, there is something to show, then investors come in, uh, then for a long time, it remains a private firm where PE P firms own equity. When it becomes large, it gets listed on, on the stock exchange. But Ugro's journey is very different. From day one, even before it earned a single rupee of revenue, it was a publicly listed company. And before and pre-revenue, Shachindra, just on the basis of his vision and his conviction, managed to raise a lot of capital. Yeah. So there were several rounds of capital. So they started their journey with a huge war chest of capital uh, given to them by these private equity funds and public market funds like Abacus, etc. Yeah. So essentially, Ugro is a listed company where people like me and you are getting an opportunity to participate in what is a venture capital firm, typically. So venture capital firms are firms that require seed stage funding, you know, where they are pre-revenue, zero revenues. So these kind of companies, usually me and you, we don't get an opportunity to invest because they are only open for VCs, right? But this is actually an example where a listed company is, is actually like a seed level company. Yeah. So that's what makes it also very exciting. It has a huge growth runway in front of itself. Uh, now, let's see how he's walking the talk. So management and board quality. So just quickly go through the names and the designations of the people on the board. Yeah. So the seven people, five at the top and two at the bottom, these are all independent directors. So 70% of the board is actually independent. 30% of the board is, uh, uh, is, is not independent. And these are all nominees. These are all nominees of uh, the PE firms that are there. Yeah. So he is walking the talk in terms of uh, eminent board of directors, very experienced board of directors led by independent directors. And this is the uh, management team that he has. Uh, he got a lot of people from Religair over. So he obviously commanded a lot of trust in his last company. So a lot of people followed him. And he also got others from industry lateral hires who have a lot of experience. So just quickly going through some of them. So Amit Mande uh, did seven years in, in Capital First. So Capital First was the firm that merged with IDFC to create IDFC First Bank. So V. Vaidyanathan, who is the CEO of Capital for, uh, of IDFC First, was the CEO there, a well-known NBFC. So he worked for seven years there. Uh, the risk officer worked for eight years in, in Religair with Shachindranath. Uh, then you have the chief business officer, again, nine years with Religair. Uh, the human resources head, uh, she worked in RBL and IDFC First Bank. Uh, the chief technology officer has uh, has co-founded and started uh, two or three, I think, fintech startups. Uh, this guy is the ex-director of Equiris Capital. Uh, 
then you have the head analytics of IAFL, who has joined them as chief innovation officer. So you can see that he has a very serious team, very serious and very capable team, right? So he is walking the talk in terms of trying to create an excellent uh, institution for lending. Yeah. So how have they sort of his his talk of you know making this an excellent corporate governance company how have they implemented it in the articles of association so articles of association is basically the uh, documentation which is formed when creating the company which lays down the rules of governance for the company yeah so let's look at that one by one so one of the requirements is uh, a big four firm is going to uh, be the statutory and internal auditors. Yeah. So this is from the 2019 PPT. Since then, they have relaxed this uh, requirement because I think the big four is very costly. So they, were, they are a small firm making low profit. They have relaxed it, but their current auditor is MSK, which is, I think, the fifth best firm in India. So this standard still holds. They want their firm to be audited by the best of companies, yeah, best of auditing companies. They want it to be uh, a listed company from day one. Yeah. Why did they want to be that? So that there is a high degree of regulatory oversight. SEBI, RBI, everybody is overseeing it, right? There's 100% transparency. You can't hide anything. Uh, and, and he wants to build a firm with a long-term mindset. Yeah. So what better way to do it than to, you know, uh, be a listed institution on the markets because listed companies are forced to think long term. Yeah, so here look at this. They said that independent directors will always comprise the majority of the board. Yeah, any shareholder holding greater than 10% will qualify for a board seat. All key committees will be headed by independent members. Uh, the majority of these committee members will constitute of independent directors, right? See this. Any loan which is greater than 1% of net worth uh, or, or made to a related party will require approval of ALCO and the approval of the board. Yeah, so ALCO is, I think, the audit committee and it will require board approval. Uh, look at the third point, removal of any KMP. Yeah, KMP means either CFO or CRO or anybody will require 75% board approval. What is he doing by putting this in the Articles of Association? He is reducing his own powers. So Shachindranath, although he's the lifeblood of the organization, on a whim, he cannot fire a CFO or CRO. Suppose they are you know, refusing to do something that he wants them to do, which may not be ethical, he cannot fire them. He needs 75% board approval to go ahead with that. Yeah. Any significant action by the company will require 75% board approval. Yeah. So you can see how the guy is walking the talk by creating a, an institution uh, which is, you know, which follows the highest standards of corporate governance. So if you look at shareholding, uh, the first item, I don't know why it's not appearing, that's the promoter. So the promoter, which is Shachindra himself, has a very small stake. He only has a 2% stake in the company. The remaining stake is, is all with these large uh, PE firms. Yeah, Even though he has only 2% stake, his entire net worth is, and, and probably more than his net worth, 110% of his net worth is probably in Ugro Capital. So we have discussed this before. Does he have skin in the game? Hell yes, he has skin in the game because he's completely, all his wealth is, I think, right now in, in Ugro stock. Yeah. So this is their language. This is not my language. They want to set up a true board-controlled management-run company no unfettered rights to promoters or management to divert strategy or business attention. Yeah. So won't explain that. That's self-explanatory. Okay. Now coming to business strategy. Okay. What exactly are they trying to do? How do they intend to do that? Yeah. So like I said, uh, they have identified that there is a $300 billion SME credit gap. Okay. Banks, NBFCs, and other institutions are right now lending $23.7 trillion INR. Whereas the demand from MSME is 45. So they want to help in bridging this gap. Yeah. So that's their core thesis that MSME is under, uh, under penetrated in terms of credit in India. So they want to come in there and make a big impact. That is number one. Number two, from their deep analysis of macro and micro uh, factors, these are the nine industries or sectors that they have uh, sort of finalized and they don't lend outside of these sectors. So they are sort of trying to uh, increase their capabilities deep in each of these subsectors, right? 
so that is two uh, you know the second business strategy is high focus on the chosen sectors yeah third is they want to uh, be a co-lending focused company yeah so again this example is there of 80 20 co-lending how it you know gives a turbo booster to your ROEs and to your profits what are the benefits to you grow what are the benefits to partner institutions so I think you guys should I'll make the PPT available I won't read this out right now because we have already discussed this to an extent but this captures all the points of benefit to a company which is doing co-lending and a bank which is receiving co-lending so you guys should go through this you will appreciate why and how co-lending is a brilliant thing and it is here to stay co-lending isn't going anywhere yeah so the third key pillar is uh, that they want to be a co-lending focused nbfc uh, again on co-lending these are their co-lending bank partners so sbi bank of baroda idbi central bank of india indian overseas bank punjab and Sindh bank these are all large public uh, banks psbs right so they have tied up with all of them and look at how fast their co-lending mix as a percentage of total AUM is increasing. In April 21, which is barely two years ago, it was 1%. Now it's 35% of AUM. This is all helping them turbocharge their uh, their profits, etc. Right? And uh, we have spoken to them. They have said that all these banks are happy so far with the kind of underwriting that they are doing. And they are all looking to increase uh, the amount of co-lending that they do with you, bro. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the fourth part is their underwriting model. How are they different, right? Everybody is claiming to you know grow fast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They are insanely data focused. Okay, look at the highlighted area. So the current underwriting model is called Grow 2.2. Okay, this is their AI ML uh, powered credit engine. Uh, what data does it take in? It takes the credit bureau data, which means all of us have a credit rating, right? Either from Crisil or from Experian or from some other company. And similarly, companies also have a credit uh, rating, right? We have seen that. So they take this data, they take their banking data, you know, bank transactions, and they use these two data to automatically crunch insights and look at this decide whether to disburse or not disburse the loan within 60 minutes so this is the engine the backend engine will throw out a yes no result to a credit officer then the credit officer has the you know the additional discretion to lend or not lend even if the credit model says go ahead lend the credit officer can still refuse the loan yeah so right now they are at grow 2.0 they want to move to grow 3.0 and they are, I think, in Q4 of this year, they will move to growth 3.0. Here, in addition to these two, you also have GST data. So look at the power of data. When all this data is coming into your engine and your AI ML algorithms are trained on all of this data, you can actually get a very, very good insight on whether I should be lending to this customer or not. And the Brilliant thing is you don't need that customer to give you collateral in terms of house or car or anything. You can analyze all of this and just figure out whether the guy has enough profitability or cash flows for you to uh, sort of be able to lend to them and for that to not become an NPA. This is called cash flow based lending. So they are very bullish about cash flow based lending. Yeah. And that's what. So this is their credit engine, which is basically they say this is their biggest differentiator. Right. And all the public banks are so far happy with it. So let's see how this evolves. I am very bullish on this. And finally, the last pillar is where they want to reach their vision. Yeah. So if you look at FY25 projected, yeah, all these figures are their visions. Yeah. So let's see where they are going to be in FY23. So they are going to have AUM of 7,000 crores. They want to triple that to 20,000 crores in FI25, yeah, which means within two years. Their off book AUM right now is 35%, which is the co lending, co origination. They want to bump that up to 50%. As a result of that, see this. Their ROE right now is between 6 to 8%. They want to go up to 18% ROE, yeah. The leverage, which is debt to equity, is 2.4x. They want to take that up to 3.8x. Yeah. So this is what basically they keep focusing on the ROE and ROA. They want to become an 18% ROE and 4% ROA company by financial year 2025. And the way they are increasing uh, their AUM, 
uh, barring any negative surprises in terms of the credit model suddenly you know going uh, wrong they, i think they are going to come very close to achieving this yeah so this is basically their their strategy it's based on these five pillars yeah now i did a forensic analysis uh, for for this company according to our checklist so because it's a financial company i removed some of the uh, checklist items i will forward the checklist for uh, financial companies to you guys it just has four or five items removed from the exhaustive checklist yeah because they are not relevant to a financial company so their overall forensic score stands at 70% so 16 out of 23 checks were clear uh, in six checks there were some issues so let's see uh, them one by one so promoter skin in the game promoter ownership is very low but like i explained this is not a problem because his 100% net worth is in is in you group yeah in auditor quality opinion uh, their remuneration the auditor remuneration as a percentage of revenue i compared with two other companies so this was double of uh, you know the other company so this is something where uh, i will investigate more yeah so this needs so anything that is highlighted in orange further investigation required related party transactions only one related party transaction uh, where you know there's this company called livefin where mr nath is a director and just today you know upon asking the company i found out that he doesn't own any stake here he is just a director he is just an advisor there but still uh, this company uh, ugro has been paying certain fees to this company for arranging co-lending deals so this also goes under you know further investigation needed scanner uh, then does director's remuneration exceed 11% pat yes it is 20% that's understandable because mr nath who was a hotshot ceo he quit in 2016 stopped taking a salary for 3 years his story is actually available on youtube he you know tells how he used to stay in 2000 3000 rupee per night hotels in mumbai when he was meeting all these hotshot pe firms trying to convince them he used to be so ashamed of where he is staying he would ask them to uh, drop them drop him you know uh, in front of a swanky hotel and then he would walk from there because he said as a as somebody who's asking crores of rupees from my investors i can't tell them that i'm living in a 2000 rupee per night hotel yeah so he i think he deserves uh, the kind of salary that he's taking anyway as the profits expand this ratio will go down yeah uh, there's been a lot of dilution that has happened and dilution will continue to happen uh, because as the aum grows uh, to keep the leverage under control the equity base has to go up so while equity base will go up through profits Uh, in the initial stages of the company we are still in the first 5 years of its lifetime uh, they will need to raise uh, some more equity so i i don't think this dilution is going to be a problem it has to be factored in while valuing this company yeah and one more thing their other expense as percentage of revenue is quite high so it's almost double of two other companies that i compared it with so this needs further investigation but overall not a bad uh, forensic score yeah nothing that jumps out at you as as clearly fraud or you know big issue so that's good so let's see how their key business metrics have uh, evolved over the years yeah so their aum uh, from 80 crores in fy19 it has gone up to 5100 crores look at the speed of growth uh, by fy23 end i think they'll be close to 6000 crores so they will have doubled in one year from fy22 to fy23 and uh, so they can i think triple from here in two years which is their target to reach 20000 aum right uh the co-lending percentage we have already seen this it has gone up to 35% it's jumping really aggressively they want to be at 50% in in fy25 uh, this is a problem area their book value per share has not been uh, you know increasing in the last 3 uh, years and uh, this is what i was referring to yesterday as well and i asked a question to them on the con call about this so basically they have been making less profits because the aum has only started growing in the last 2 years but uh, due to you know esop issuance and creating an esop pool uh, they ate into some of their equity so whatever profit was getting added to equity that got diluted because they had to issue uh, esops to their employees so this is i won't uh, lie this is an area of concern for me and this is what i'm going to track very very closely this quarter onwards their book value should start seriously going up whatever profit comes in should start adding to book value and that is what they have confirmed in the last con call as well that no more you know equity will be diverted here or there uh, 
So this this needs to go up. Otherwise, the company will never get re-rated. If the book value doesn't increase, then uh, uh, financial company is not becoming more valuable. The GNPA and NPAs are under control. 1.7% GNPA, 1.1% NNPA is not bad for an NBFC lending to a risky sector. Of course, you have to keep in mind that the company has only started loans seriously in FY20, right? So in FY23, now uh, the loans are only about three years old. So actually a loan starts becoming NPA probably a little later in its life, maybe fourth year, fifth year. So this number, while it looks optically good, we have to keep seeing whether the number spikes up or whether the number remains at this level in FI24, FI25. I hope it remains at the same level. The confidence with which they talk about their credit model, I think it should remain at the same level. Uh, their ROA and ROE numbers are quite low right now uh, because uh, if you look at their FI23 and FI22, um, uh, you know, the screener uh, page, uh, there's a lot of extra tax that they have paid in in this year earlier they were getting a tax benefit and this year onwards they have been paying 30 40 percent tax so that's because of some deferred tax uh, liabilities etc that were there so that has sort of artificially depressed their roe a little bit otherwise the roe i think is closer to six percent right now yeah so this they plan to uh, bring this up to 18 percent in fi25 and this they plan to bring it up to four percent so it's an uphill task, but uh, if there are no tax issues going forward and if the credit model keeps performing like this, uh, their AOM will keep growing. So I see no reason why they can't, you know, uh, achieve those numbers. But yeah, of course, we'll have to keep a watch on that. Uh, yeah, so this I already touched upon this, that this is an area of concern, but the book value compounding should start from this quarter onwards. I'll be on the lookout for that. Okay, so. Uh, last bit, valuations and view. So the way I've approached this is I've tried to compare this with a few pairs of its uh, size. And I've tried to see relative to them, how does the valuation look like? Uh, so just to let you guys know, right now, I think Ugro is trading at 1.1x book. Yeah, 1.1x book means anything trading at 1x book means the, uh, the market doesn't expect the company to grow in the future. Because if it does expect the company to grow, it would assign it a multiple of book value, not 1x book value. So it's being valued as a company which the com market is very circumspect about. Yeah, And that's probably due to you know these depressed ROE and ROA numbers. I think the market is not giving uh, the company credit for the innovative corporate governance model, uh, the kind of credit underwriting that they are doing. And I think the market is going to get surprised with the results soon. So, with that context, it's uh, compared with some of its peers. Uh, so I, I compared it with four other companies, you know, Five Star, Credit Access, TrueCap, and Spandana. Yeah. So in terms of AUM, uh, Credit Access is much larger, but uh, you grow Five Star and Spandana are pretty much in the same bracket. Yeah. TrueCap is very small. If you look at GNP and NPA, Ugro is pretty much uh, in, a, in a comfortable space in terms of uh, the peers. Spandana has really high numbers. This is a microfinance company, so not strictly comparable. But yeah, it also lends to a risky segment. So in terms of GNP and NPA, not a big concern. This is where the difference is in terms of ROA, ROE. If you look at Five Star and Credit Access, the kind of model they have followed is these companies have been around for 10, 15 years, yeah? And they have followed the other model, which I talked about, where they started lending, they built up some reputation, then some uh, private equity firms came in, they gave them additional capital, they used that capital to grow further. They demonstrated uh, their underwriting, et cetera, for 10 years, 15 years in the private market. Then when their ratios were already good, when their ratios were already 15%, uh, you know, 4% uh, ROA, 15% ROE, that's when they decided to come into the market and do an IPO. So the market instantly valued them at, at 4x uh, price to book, 3x price to book, etc. Yeah. So you grow, like I said, it's like participating in a seed stage of a company. Yeah. So we are right now in that stage. Fortunately for us, the company is listed. So we are able to see its journey uh, where we are not able to see the journey that Five Star and Credit Access have already done. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is a big difference. But TrueCap and Spandana have really poor numbers. Spandana actually has a loss in, in, in this year. Uh, they are going to come out of this. Uh, but uh, anyway, so these two numbers are not very good. But 
you know five star and credit access is where yogro can be if they execute properly in the next couple of years as per their targets yeah so look let's look at their valuations now so yogro is at 1.1x book five star is at 4x credit access is at 3.5x so my thesis is that yogro will reach these levels in the next two to three years yeah that's why i'm invested in the company true cap i don't know why this company is rated uh, so richly is valued so richly its ratios are very poor uh, Pranav has covered this company. Maybe he has some insights. And my ROE and ROA figures actually don't agree with his, uh, which is put on notion. So maybe tomorrow, uh, Pranav, when you're presenting, you can just uh, touch on this. Uh, yeah, so I, I think Ugro can go from one, one X to about three X. And that is what I'm betting on. Of course, this three X price to book value will not mean the price will become three X because there'll be some equity dilution. So maybe the price will become only 2x or 2.5x if, if the thesis plays out. Of course, there's a disclaimer that all of this uh, is, is provided the best case scenario pans out. If the credit model is uh, not good enough, or if the market never gains confidence on Shachindranath because of his past, then it's very much possible that the company goes nowhere and I make no money. Yeah but you have to take bets as an investor right and this therefore this is my bet so the one line summary is if you grow can maintain its fast growth uh, start compounding its book value where book value doesn't get diverted here and there and it keeps adding and the credit quality which means whatever they claim about their underwriting if that holds up it can get re-rated easily to above 2x book value actually it should be closer to 3x book value and that's it. I think I finished in 31 minutes. Thank you. Wow. This was a great presentation. One question that I have, Nirvan, was yeah. uh, will they be impacted by cyclicality of MSME businesses? Uh, see, they will be uh, impacted to an extent. See, every credit lending company will have a cycle to it. Yeah, but uh, because they are so small with an AUM of 5,000 crores, mm -hmm. I don't really think that in the next two, three years, even if the cycle comes off a little, their growth is going to really slow down. Uh, maybe it will slow down a little, but I don't think it will slow down uh, enough for it to be called cyclical at this stage of their journey. Yeah. When they become bigger, I think, yes, they will be more prone to cyclicality. Right, right. Okay, got it. And the second thing is um, the, the platform Grow 2.0. I think this would be a very useful platform for anybody who's who's actually into this space. Um, are they offering this platform as a as a you know service? Yes. yes, yes, they are. They are. So one of their offerings is where they give this platform as a marketplace. Uh, what happens is so there is there are other fintechs right which are smaller than you grow not listed which are also trying to earn business and they also want to do co-lending where they source the loan and they want to give it off to a bank but the bank doesn't trust their co uh, their credit engine right so what you grow has started doing is say they have started offering it as a service where the third party fintech can actually bring a loan get it certified on you grow's platform and then Yogro can connect with all its co-lending partners and say, okay, see, this is certified by my credit engine. Since you trust my credit engine, are you willing to take this loan? So oh, that becomes okay. like a marketplace. That's super, I think. Yeah. So that is another, you know, possible pillar of growth that can happen. But that's very far into the future. So I, I have not factored that in, in my thesis. But if their engine is solid, if their credit engine is solid, then there's no stopping them, I think. Yeah, I, I think I think the incremental growth or or you know that exponential growth might come from this area only. Is yeah, possible. Point? And and uh, this area will be a pure fee income. Yeah, so uh -huh. they won't have to like put a single uh, rupee of capital into this. So it'll be a pure fee income. Whatever uh, lending risk, equity, etc., will be between the bank and the third party fintech. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, on screener, so I was just looking at yeah. profit and loss and um, PL statement, and there was tax was in yeah. negative. So, what does that mean, actually? Yeah, so tax meaning tax being negative, Shantaru, means that uh, 
this particular company is uh, had some tax credits okay uh, you're talking about let me show it to everybody uh, yeah the pnl yeah you're talking about these numbers yeah, yeah these numbers right yeah so basically tax being negative means uh, shantanu that when uh, you know in 2019 when they acquired chokhani securities there was a, another company called asia pragati fin which got merged into this company okay, okay. and that company was carrying a lot of deferred tax assets okay. which means uh, assets which could be set off against your tax liabilities so they were actually able to use uh, you know those credits i think to sort of add to their profits so their roe numbers here in 1920 don't reflect the real picture the real picture is reflected at the pbt level okay yeah and okay. and you you see here so i'll show you the tax rate at the for for september and december 2022 right you see the tax rate for q2 and q3 in in this financial year 70% so what happened is those deferred tax assets that they had got na they started getting lapsed uh -huh. so so now i think they have to compensate for a part of it or something like that so basically uh, they they have a lot of deferred tax assets and liability adjustment that has been going on so this therefore has been depressing their pat right in in this financial year that's why yeah. a lot of investors are frustrated because you see the pat is not translating in uh, pbt is not translating into pat Mm -hmm. so they have said that next quarter onwards it should normalize to 25 30% so let's see okay. i have a general question so yeah. say for example there's a loss making financial company right um mm -hmm. it, it's absolutely in debt and it's going through nclt and all uh ugro comes and acquires that company say at a at a at say 20% of its book value right mm -hmm. but the company has a lot of liability uh can they maybe use the uh, you know tax liability or or the losses and offset it against their gains at say 20% purchase valuation did you get my mm, question no not exactly or you okay. have to help me out here okay okay so think of a company which is say uh, its book value is 100 but mm. it has say uh, tax liability or, or it has made losses of say negative uh, 200 okay okay mm -hmm. yeah it, it needs to give it back to the lenders now ugro right. comes and probably purchases this company at say 20 crore or 30 crore or 50 crore 50 crore right. let's say, let's let's say 50 crore uh once they acquire it they acquired the entire uh, negative uh, this thing as well the, the yeah yeah lender. so that's what they have been using for these that's why you have these kind of figures mm -hmm. okay interesting Yeah. So, so, so that so, way they can they can offset their own earnings. I mean, with the profit that they make, they can buy some you know cheaper company. I don't know how the account accounting will be, but then they can buy some defunct company, and then you know when the financial comes together, the profit that these guys make versus the losses that that company has made kind of uh, helps. Yeah. Them so the get... losses will basically help you save tax. Mm -hmm. Correct. Because they they will be offset against the profits that you make, the PBTs that you make in the future. so mm. they will be offset against that oh, so a lot of companies use you know that kind of uh, an approach for uh, in acquisitions that is actually um, listed as one of the benefits of the acquisition that uh, in in the future our consolidated tax rate will go down because the acquiring company we acquired the company for some other reason because it's going to uh, you know in uh, give us incremental value etc etc but at the same time they have a lot of uh, tax losses carried forward which we can use to offset our tax uh, our, our pbt so that is that happens interesting okay yeah thanks so in this case actually you know the fact that they are not only offsetting pbt they are actually adding to pbt when when you are coming to pat uh, uh let let me try and figure out what exactly happened here yeah, i'm i'm pretty sure it's something to do with you know losses carried forward uh, but how they are adding to pbt to actually enhance the uh, pbt to pat that i'll i'll get back to you guys tomorrow yeah any other questions excuse me i was asking yeah rishikesh uh, in np numbers you mentioned after 4 to 5 years the np numbers will kick in so i was asking what is the tenure of loans they are lending so is uh -huh. are they lending long tenure yeah that's a good question rishikesh so i don't think that um, 
so they are lending to msmes i think i don't remember the figure exactly rishikesh but i think uh, it's uh, three year tenure i think the reason i said that nps will kick in later is because most of their lending see their aom has been building up only here right while well, they've been existence here but most of their lending has actually happened in the last one year or is okay. currently happening right so yes, even yes. if the aging, even if the tenure is 3 years the real hits will probably happen 2 years from now because they are right now at peak growth right in terms of percentage rates they are at peak growth right now so i i being conservative would actually you know not start celebrating these numbers right now i will see the fi25 gnp and npa numbers when all this lending this aggressive lending they are doing how that performs okay got it got it. Yeah, good question, Rishikesh. Thanks. Uh, I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes, yes. we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, when we talk about co-lending, when I was doing uh, data capturing of uh, some other uh, NGOs, I don't remember the name, but I saw their co-lending partner as Ugro Capital. So, can uh, NGOs can do? Can NGOs? in poland uh, with another ngoc or is it just we can they can do it no no it's your bank it's allowed it's allowed uh, so uh, pranav you need to figure out uh, is you grow their asset side partner or liability side partner yeah so asset side partner means that whatever loan you grow is underwriting yeah from you grow's perspective i'm saying so from you grow's perspective whatever loan uh, that you grow is underwriting uh, that is being passed on to the nbfc so that is also possible yeah uh, on the other hand liability would mean that the nbfc is actually it's it's usually a fintech not an nbfc uh, an nbfc or fintech is actually underwriting a loan and then passing it on to ugro ugro is taking it on its books so i think since it's an nbfc i think it's it's an asset side lending only so it's just like ugro has a tie up with banks ugro has a tie up with that nbfc as well i think Okay, uh, and about two cap, uh, I don't remember the uh, matrix as of now. Yeah. But I also agree that uh, I don't like the bank. I don't like the NBFC because when I was capturing the data, their presentation and their annual reports, they were not helpful in many ways. Like I didn't find, find I didn't found many of the matrix because their uh, presentations mainly they are not uh, very yeah. structured. They are not very structured. I cannot find many matrix because of. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that's a good observation, uh, Pranav. Actually, I also sort of got the same impression. मुझे भी समझ नहीं आ रहा है कि why this company is trading at 3.5x book. And uh, just एक बार तुम ROI ROI numbers ना जो तुमने update किए वो दोबारा check करो. क्योंकि मेरे हिसाब से तो the ROI ROI is what I presented here. I'll share this PPT right now. uh yeah true cap i also don't understand yaar yeah, ki matlab what exactly is happening there uh but yeah maybe we'll choose it as one of the companies you know that we want to deep dive into further that uh, you know one of you might present and we may solve the mystery yeah but i agree with your observation okay uh no more questions right so i'll stop sharing and i'll share this ppt and uh, gorab as usual has the